Hello and good morning from New York and good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us from elsewhere. Uh, my name is Tunç Şen. Uh, I'm the deputy director of the Sarkap Sabancı um, Center for Turkish Studies uh, here at Columbia University uh, and assistant professor in the Department of History. It's our great pleasure to welcome you all to today's special panel featuring two distinguished guests, uh, Professor uh, Aisha Chalar and Professor Shayla Ben Habib. Uh, I'll, I will leave the floor to my esteemed colleague um, and Sakib Sabanji visiting Professor of Turkish Studies, Zeynep Çelik, to introduce our guests. But before doing that, I would like to express our gratitude to Sakib Sabanji family for their invaluable support to promote events about Turkish studies here in New York and the US. And many thanks to Ararat Shekarian, our uh, program manager for his logistical support. Uh, without further ado, I'm now turning to Professor Zeynep Çelik to introduce our guests today. Thank you, Tunç. Today, we have a much anticipated discussion on an urgent topic between two eminent social scientists, Professors Ayşe Çağlar and Sheila Benhabib. Ayşe Çağlar's presentation titled Migrants, Disempowered Cities and Effective Landscapes will be followed by Sheila Benhabib's comments. We will then open the discussion to our audience. Please post your questions in the chat box. Let me introduce our guests briefly. Ayşe Çağlar is a professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Vienna and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences, again in Vienna. Currently, she's a fellow at the Zollberg Institute on Migration and Mobility, New Schools. She taught and held fellowships at various European universities. Her recent work focuses on the interface between migrant and city-making processes and urban politics. She has edited a special issue on displacements and dispossessions in Refugee Watch 2021 and a volume titled Urbaner Protest, Revolte in the Neoliberalen Stadt 2019. She is the co-author of Migrants and City Making, Dispossession, Displacement and Urban Regeneration 2018, and co-editor of Locating Migration, Rescaling Cities and Migrants 2010. She has a forthcoming co-edited volume, Sites of Statelessness, Law, Cities, and Seas. We're looking forward to this book, which will be published by Sunni Press. Sheila Ben-Habib is the Eugene Mayer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy Emerita at Yale University and is Senior Research Scholar and Professor Adjunct of Law at Columbia University. She's also an affiliate professor of philosophy and senior fellow at Columbia University's Center for Contemporary Critical Thought. She has written and co-edited over 15 books on critical theory, from Hegel to Habermas, Hannah Arendt, discourse ethics, feminist theory, and human rights. Her work has been translated into 12 languages. Her most recent book is Exile, Statelessness and Migration, Playing Chess with History from Hannah Arendt to Isaiah Berlin, 2018. Now I will pass the word to uh, Aisha. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this introduction and for the invitation and I'm very pleased and honored to be part of your series and also very much looking forward to our conversation with Shayla Ben Habib and then later on with the questions. Um, uh, without uh, losing much time, let me start that. I mean, together with the rise of right-wing popular support, there has been an increasing attention to the deepening of social, economic, 
and demographic cleavages between the high growth urban clusters, uh, metropoles and small and mid-sized cities, and also rural areas. Places that are often referred to as quote unquote left behind are and characterized by economic stagnation, decline, depopulation, high unemployment and entrenched poverty came to be seen as engines of right-wing support. These places have almost become a trope for discussing the current surge of populism in scholarship and public debates. Interestingly, in the depiction of the rise of popular politics in these economically troubled cities, though migrants has a very strong discursive presence, there's very little attention paid to migrants themselves and their location in making and remaking of the economic, social, political, and the affective fabric of these cities. As Nina Glick-Schiller and I have been arguing for more than a decade, studying and theorizing the location of migrants in cities of varying scale has been neglected. Relation of migrants and migration dynamics continue to be theorized, I underline, not that research is being done, but in terms of theorization, predominantly on the basis of research conducted on powerful metropoles and or gateway cities. This neglect is striking for several reasons. First, and briefly, there has been an increasing trend of migrant settlement in mostly depopulated declining towns and in rural areas, at least since the 1990s, if not earlier. Today's refugee settlements are also no exception to this pattern. Furthermore, not only are migrants increasingly settling in these places, many of such depopulated and declining cities actively reach out and welcome migrants and refugees as part of their efforts of revitalization. Here, I'm not referring to the welcoming culture that became prominent after the so-called refugee crisis in 2015, but I'm referring to cities which connect welcoming migrants to desired anticipated prosperity. There are a number of economically and demographically troubled cities in Europe Europe, US, which welcome migrants as part of such efforts. Secondly, I think this neglect is striking theoretically for highlighting the persistent grip of methodological nationalism in migration scholarship and policies. Despite the scholarship documenting and theorizing the economic and judicial fracturing of the nation state territoriality in the context of current globalization, in studying the opportunities of migrant settlement, dynamics, the unevenness in studying them, the unevenness of state spaces in terms of the nature of opportunities for migrants is still neglected. The location of migrants in cities, as I said, continue to be theorized as if the nation state space were legally, economically, and politically even. This creates a major hindrance in understanding the variation of opportunities and constraints for migrant emplacement within the particular dynamics of the cities that are variably shaped in close relation to the city's location within the value generation processes unfolding in the city, in that particular city at a given historical conjuncture. In my talk, I will first focus on why I think it is important to look at, to look through the lens of disempowered cities to the dynamics and the paradoxes of neoliberal city making and migrant emplacement. I will come back to this uh, neoliberal city making, why I took that. Then I turn to our analytical vocabulary in migration scholarship and argue for a shift from the concept of mobility to displacement in addressing the dynamics of urban development and migration. Finally, I will draw attention to the materiality of both decline and urban renewal refurbishment inscribed on city spaces in these disempowered cities in terms of their impact on the emergent populist sentiments and politics of that. However, anti-migrant populism is only one part of the story of the complex dynamics in these cities to which I will come back and complicate it at the end of my talk. 
By what do we mean by disempowered cities? Uh, disempowered cities basically refer to pl places that are marked by losses, loss of population, loss of tax base, economic, political, and cultural power in relationship to other localities. They are disempowered in terms of access to capital, investment, human capital, and national power. They are cities with to, I mean, in a nutshell, there are cities with limited resources available for their residents. However, I think it is important to underline that these are not simply powerless cities. They not only used to be powerful, but also have material traces and memory of this past, facilitating the residents and city leaders' ability to relate to the days of power gone in contrast to their current powerlessness. These cities have an infrastructure and built environment, though decaying or not, reminiscent of both the powerful past as well as its aftermath, the decline and the loss. This, the, so that the materiality of past grandeur and loss are inscribed onto their cityscapes. This is important in terms of, I think, understanding the expectations as well as the residents' frustrations, the processes of urban renewal lead to in these places or if you want urban development. In scrutinizing the sentiments that mark these towns, scholars often highlight the impact of the materiality of decline and failing infrastructure, I think rightly so. Such declining and depopulated places are often framed with a focus on their so-called emptiness and disconnectedness to explore their depopulation, abandonment, and capital re-territorialization in connection to each other. For example, the concept of emptiness is used to underline the expulsion of places and people from circuits of capital and care of the state and its multifaceted impact on the daily lives and sentiments of their residents. On a similar fashion, anthropologists working on post-industrial cities highlight the spatial and material disconnectivity of these towns from state, market, and capital, in contrast to intense connectivity of global cities. Consequently, this disconnectedness from the global circuits of capital and political power strongly felt in these decaying cities and sites and places is hailed to be established the axis of the effective politics of left behind places. I would like to situate myself uh, a little bit differently from this perspective, although building upon. It is true that such cities are marked by abandonment and decay. However, no matter how rich these ethnographies are in terms of documenting the daily sentiments and agonies of uh, living in such places, disconnectedness attributed to declining cities, in my opinion, is ill-suited to understand the realities and the global trajectories of value regimes these cities are counting. Approaching these towns as if they fell outside of the mobile and uneven networks of capitalism, or as if only the cities that are designated as global are subject to the network globe spanning dynamics, might, I think, obscure the complex processes these cities are entangled with. In fact, we have clearly showed in our work that no matter how the places seemed or felt to be disconnected, or empty, they were in fact very strongly inserted into various scale or scales of social, economic, political, and cultural networks, organizations, and institutions. It depends how you looked at it to uh, ex uh, ex excavate or see the connections. Instead, I think I argue that approaching these cities as rather than disconnected, as disempowered, provides us a more suitable conceptual frame to understand their multiscalar connections and the dilemmas within which their economic, social, cultural life are embedded into, and to analyze the impact of the simultaneous, I underline that, materiality of decay and renewal on the formation of the residents' subjectivities. 
No matter how disconnected their residents fell, these cities, towns are part of the global transformation and re-territorialization, but they are positioned differently and more disadvantaged than those more powerful cities. Rather than a lens of disconnectedness or emptiness, I think the concept of disempowerment, disempoweredness, glo uh, Glick Schiller and I have developed is more suitable to glimpse at the multiscalar making and unmaking making of the uh, social, political, affective fabric of such cities and to address the contradictions, frictions, and paradoxes of migrant lives and sociabilities unfolding in such places. Um, uh, most of the industrialized cities, disempowered cities are not, could not be equated right away to the, the industrialized cities. Uh, most industrialized cities fall into the category, but there are others that have been centers of commerce, trade, culture, and religion, which were powerful and became disempowered, but were not the industrialized in the strict sense of the term, as they were never industrial towns to start with. However, no matter whether the basis of their power were industrial commerce, the lost power had been inscribed into the cityscapes as abandoned, neglected, decaying infrastructure, industrial areas, or cultural architectural heritage. These material inscriptions in, on the cityscape contribute to the potency of narratives and imaginaries of successful, glorious past decline, as well as the current renewal and improvement in today's our, our, um, anger and resentment present in these kind of places. Furthermore, I think disempowered cities are important to provide an, they, import, they provide us an important entry point to explore the contradictions, fault lines, the injuries brought about by a particular form of urban regeneration. These injuries could become more acute and visible in these disempowered cities rather than they are in better resourced and more powerful ones. Thus, looking through the lens of these cities, particularly to those which had also adopted welcoming narratives for migrants minorities, might prove to be fruitful in providing insights into the paradoxes and effects of particular form of urban development on the emplacement of migrants and migrant dynamics and their location in city making processes. In our research, we adopted a relational comparative approach to explore the urban regeneration processes geared to overcome the economic and social decline and the location of migrants in three relatively disempowered cities. These cities were, I'm underlining, were historically different from each other in their economic, political positioning within regional, national, and global networks that connected them to the world. Located in nation states with very different histories, discourses, legacies, and policies of migration, the cities of our focus were, I'm not denying that there were, they were same, there were different histories. But the cities that we took were Manchester in New Hampshire, USA, Halle and Zale in the former German Democratic Republic today in Federal Republic of Germany, and Mardin on the border of Turkey and Syria. You see that they are very, very different cities of very different histories. Without negating the different histories of these places, we try to explore how seemingly different practices within configurations of intersecting forces led to similar outcome and how these were experienced and transformed. Here, the focus is actually the location of migrants, minorities. Uh, and in parts refugees in them. Those the two selected parameters, we have explored the interrelationship between the repositioning efforts of a city and migrant emplacement, a process that is entangled with the revaluation of urban spaces, property, actors, and institutions we were assessing. In all these cities, despite their small numbers, migrants, refugees, and the selected minorities were very small numbers. They acquired a very strong 
presence and played an important role in cities' narratives and efforts to reposition themselves by trying to alter their local, regional, and global connectedness vis-a-vis -vis power hierarchies at a particular conjunction. So we conducted a conjunctural analysis by tracing to by trying to trace why and how certain policies forms of governance, sets of institutions and actors near and far come together at particular points of time and spaces within a given power geometry. This meant focusing on changing narratives, concepts, forms of legitimation and contestation, sensibilities, interpersonal relations, and interrelations between governance and other domains of social life. Though I could not get into the details of each city and our comparative parameters here, which we detail and apply in our book, Migrants and City Making, um, at the turn of the millennium, each of these cities have embarked on systematic efforts to reposition themselves. The goal was to create, renew the infrastructure and initiate vitality that could attract international as well as national corporate and financial investors as a way to overcome their stagnation. In this endeavor, all face the challenge of altering their negative images. Depopulation and racism in Halle, Halle was told to be as that had the reputation of a neo-Nazi castle, and terror and poverty in Mardin, and violence and poverty in Mardin, in quotations, and disreputable abandonment in Manchester. In each city, the leaders referenced the migrants and minorities in their speeches and websites to signal globally that the city was open to the world and safe and stable and thus suitable for investment. In each city, migrants and uh, minority populations acquired an increased value within these narratives and in other uh, uh, revaluation processes. Here, I think it is important to note that the broader context of the strategies and policies I'm referring to here is neoliberal city making in its various forms and shades, which is geared towards, in a very, uh, briefly generating wealth by making the city competitive through a particular form of urban development. This is the context in which cities increasingly, quote unquote, unleash themselves as engines of economy, centers of trade, investment and innovation from the federal and national state. And this unleashing is related with the restructuring of capital, which alters the value regimes and governance in these cities. In this context, so this is this is nothing new. This is what uh, many of you that uh, would uh, know. This is a, a common, uh, very briefly, the dynamics. In this context, the city's enterprising capacities, including human capital, encompassing also migrants and minorities, have been reconsidered and rediscovered in order to enhance the city's competitive advantages to cap attract capital investment and uh, to uh, generate well. To make the city more appealing in all of them, the developers and city leaders, like in other places, focused on urban development with substantial intervention into the built environment, starting with the renewal of the city center and the abundant and dilapidated buildings in order to revive their economies. In all these cities, despite their differences, we saw that the typical mechanisms of this kind of urban were set in motion, provision of public subsidies for private development using corporate tax incentives, capital subsidies, or provisioning of the commons and the public land to corporations for num numerous projects of urban revival below market prices. This is the game in town, actually, in most of the cities. But due to their disempowered nature of these cities, the effects of these processes of urban redevelopment on city budget and their residents' livelihoods were felt more drastically than in well-resourced cities. Here, I would like to open a caveat. The semantics and the concepts through which we approach the dynamics of cities and migrant lives 
are important. I argue that in order to capture the mutually constitutive process of migrant emplacement and city making and scrutinize their effects on its residents, we need to shift our lens from mobility to displacement. I'm aware that mobility studies are having still having their heydays, but I still think that we need to shift our lens from mobility to displacement. And I am fully aware that there have been calls to shift our analytical vocabulary from migration to mobility in order to be able to acknowledge the quote unquote autonomy and the agency of migrants and counter the sedentary logic of migration scholarship policies and politics. Though I think it is important to highlight the migrants agency in their acts of mobility, I think the concept of mobility is constraining. One of the main problems is giving mobility a central stage in the analysis of migrants' practices and relations is that mobility is a concept closed and related to the nation state. The nation state often occupies a central role in defining and institutionalizing what counts as mobility and what kinds of mobilities and whose mobility are rendered visible and invisible. We know that not every mobile person is designated as a migrant, and there are many people designated as migrants who had not moved from anywhere to anywhere, or anywhere to anywhere so-called third, fourth generation migrants. Thus the mobility lens is very much embedded within the political regimes of nation states and the selected mobilities it sheds light onto while overshadowing all other mobilities and also uh, Defy and the immobilities of people. If we look at the migrants, actually, more than the mobility, especially with the refugees, immobilities define their, uh, uh, their lives and then their uh, relations. So, um, and I think there are also other benefits of using the concept of displacement. First of all, it, it allows us to address series of interrelated processes, which are obscured by the concept of mobility. Displacement refers to spatial as well as downward social movement. And in both forms, it refers to the disruptions or transformations of previous relations to people and places. While the concept of mobility does not necessarily connect the processes underlying migration with each other, the concept of displacement, because the, in the mobility, the focus is on the action, but the, with the, the, uh, the uh, displacement uh, could, the concept of displacement connects us to the other key processes of capital formation, restructuring and dispossessions, which are central to migrants' uh, lives and city making. So it enables us to see and analyze how seemingly independent processes, but also locations, as well as institutions of varying scale, are, ultimately interconnected with each other. With the concept of the concept of displacement enables us to capture, to address these. And I'm, uh, I'm, the, I'm not trying to make a splash in a glass of water. The conceptual network of analysis, uh, we know that only uh, not only determines what we reveal and what we obscure, but it is also related to the semantics of thinking about difference, connections, and domains of commonalities among city residents. Both migrants, in, in our case, that uh, looking at the uh, urban uh, migrants in the urban setting, both migrants and non-migrants are subject to the process of displacement and dispossession within the urban development dynamics in cities. For this reason, the concept of displacement facilitates us to capture not only the interdependencies among the processes, but also the resulting common conditions which come to mark the lives of many urban residents. That is to say, the displaced may include those who have stayed in place and claim to be quote unquote natives, as well as people of migrant background who have moved and worked to build new lives. The concept of displacement enables the scholars to focus on the forces that underlie both the increased movement of people 
within states and across state borders and the growing downward mobility of those who stay within their city, country or region, but feel increasingly left behind or displaced in their own city and country. Most importantly, the concept of displacement enables us to approach migrants and quote unquote non-migrants defined as non-migrants, people defined as non-migrants from within a common analytical lens so that we do not have separate analytics to understand the dynamics of these groups of uh, people. In the context of rising populism, I think any actor moving beyond the binaries of difference generated by national imaginaries that dominate public discourses is particularly important. This is important because the binaries such as quote unquote migrants and natives often establish the building blocks of the antagonistic discourses of populist politics. In each city, we observed that migrants became part of multi-scalar financial, cultural, commercial, and political networks that link the city to other locations, institutions, and to funding streams. They became, they became, I can't go into those kind of the examples, but maybe in the discussion, we can talk about them. They became the actors and subjects of processes of regeneration by helping to constitute, but also to unfold networks of multiple institutions of re repositioning. Thus they became city makers. And well, I would like to come to also look at the, some of those narratives that I was referring to. In all three cities we studied, we all saw that the, these dynamics entail two kinds of entangled welcoming narratives. One was business investment friendly, and the other one was migrant, quote unquote, foreigner, refugee, and sometimes minority friendly narrative. While the business welcoming narratives translated themselves into a number of programs and incentives to attract capital and investment, migrant minority welcoming narratives did not translate into any concrete programs and incentives with funding. The contrast between those two narratives and the actual, the welcoming narratives and an actual a minimal provisioning of services to migrants present in each city was striking. So while the letter remains simply at the discursive level, but very strongly at the discursive level, the business friendly incentives were connected to concrete policies about subsidies, tax rebates, abolishment of business and corporate tax taxes to prove and perform the investment friendliness of the city. In, so, uh, so the city generation, regeneration in all three cities we studied was shaped by a strong dependence on public funding, which was very weak in these cities to start with. In all the three cities, infrastructure improvement and city center renewal took primacy like in many other. Interestingly, despite their similar, as I said, small numbers, migrants, refugees, and selected minorities became actors and targets of these plans, mechanisms, and narratives for city center reconstruction, real estate, and property revaluation. Migrants and refugees, for example, were central in accessing federal programs, including, including housing and urban development in Manchester, which was crucial to refurbish the dilapidated city center, returnee migrants, minorities, particularly Syria, Christian minority in uh, Mardin, were also central in reaching out some national, but mainly international and supranational, including UNDP, World Bank, UNESCO, and pre-accession EU funds. That proved to be crucial for the comprehensive quote unquote, rehabilitation of the old city center. So the processes of re urban regeneration, the valorization of cities selected minorities and the revaluation of property uh, for heritage tourism, for example, in Mardin were very closely entangled. However, despite these cities success, in attracting some domestic and international capital, public revenue streams did not increase because of the nature of the adopted form of urban development. 
within the context of sharp reductions in central government spending on local government in the name of neoliberal austerity, these projects left the three cities with even fewer resources for public services. Public money was extended to corporate capital with the justification that the projects would then attract further corporate and financial investors in then the, or the promised prosperity will come. However, they attracted uh, federal, international, and supranational funds that were channeled into renewable projects, filled the coffers of developers, multinational corporations, and uh, rather than the uh, local funds, uh, local funds. For example, in uh, Mardin, the the cost of labor for business was 62% cheaper with those kind of projects than any other city. And, and, and also um, the social security insurance for, this, uh, uh, for the labor was taken very much by the uh, city, of course, burdening the city budget. So despite the influx of investments and funds, each city ended up relying on public monies and debt for their regeneration projects. In fact, in Manchester, Halle and Mardin, the city debt increased drastically after more than a decade of urban regeneration projects and some capital flow. In and then, but they drained the local funds available for public services, ranging from education to transportation drastically. So after more than a decade of renewal projects and flow of capital investments, all three cities ranked within the top five cities with highest debt in their respective country. In all three of the cities, despite renewal and flow of some capital, disparities and poverty increase. For example, in 2011, because of that, I mean, my work is not really exactly always, I mean, has not been on Turkey, but because of the um, uh, sub center, center, I'm picking up for some of the examples from Mardin, but I could always also do it from Halle or uh, Manchester. For example, in 2011, a Hilton hotel was opened in Mardin. In 2013, major industrial holding company from Istanbul invested a 2.5 million factory. The same year, Howlett Packard announced a hundred million dollar investment in a digital advertising printing facility in the city region. At the same time, the city debt increased in such a way that the city was not even able to pay its employees and owed a large sum even to the players of its soccer team. Within this regeneration processes that were intertwined with incentives to revalue property sites, local histories, some sectors of the population migrants, uh, of population migrants, and some of the historic minority populations. Here I underline some because this is this is very important to look at it, how certain minority groups were selected. They acquired an increased value and they came to be situated as actors and subjects of the, this repositioning of their cities with the promise of prosperity. Migrants and minorities upfront position in these narratives stood in contrast to the increased inequalities, debt, and dispossessions resulting from this form of urban generation. This contrast established a very fertile ground for polarized politics. These dynamics of urban regeneration led to simultaneous developments providing both opportunities and challenges to migrants in city making in all three cities. Migrants and foreigners, also the multinational corporations also, who were upfront in the welcoming narratives, were increasingly made the scapegoat of the effects of dispossessive dynamics of this particular form of urban regeneration, namely of draining public of draining public resources, explaining the lack of public services to city residents. In the context of dispossessive effects of this form of urban regeneration, the entangled welcoming narratives, 
contributed to anger and resentment with a racist juxtaposition of natives and migrants foreigners. Within, this rene within the renewal projects, some of the abundant dilapidated places reminding both of, as I said, the power of the past and its loss were being restored and put into use, raising the residents' expectations about the re-empowerment and built of their city and improvement of their livelihood. However, despite the improvements in built environment and glossy renovations, and in all of those three cities, actually, there were lots of glossy renovations and refurbished storefronts, the residents remained further impoverished with fewer public services and increasing inequalities, fueling the feeling of what Hassan Hajj identifies as stuckedness. Hajj argues that people who have the feeling that their lives are not moving in line with others and the changes in their environment experience a feeling of existential immobility, thus stuckedness. Stuckedness is shaped by a specific form of waiting for something undesirable, such as the erosion of livelihoods and disempowerment to come to end. In all three cities, the juxtaposition of the partly improved and renovated built environment, especially the glossy city center, giving the impression of improvement and the reality of increased impoverishment inflicted this feeling of stuckedness with one's life. However, this is only one part of the story. Simultaneous to becoming the scapegoats in the populist sentiments, we also found that these disempowered cities provided particular opportunities for migrants, refugees to become part of the local politics. Indeed, investigating the location of migrants in city making in this kind of cities with limited resources provided new insights into the particular opportunities that emerged in these places for migrants, refugees, especially in terms of membership and redrawing the boundaries of the political community and local politics. The disempoweredness of these cities ironically opened local spaces for politics, for migrants, minorities in a particular way, but also it is a transformative aspect of the politics in those places, but of course in a uh, limited sense. As noted, there were no municipal resources invested in provisioning of migrant specific services, let alone on religious ethnic community based ones. However, this lack of resources and programs for any kind of institutionalization of difference, ironically opened opportunities for migrants, refugees, and the quote unquote natives, not only to build sociabilities based on domains of commonality, on shared experience and effect, but also to become part of lo po local politics with broader claims of social justice beyond the given boundaries of identity politics without an emphasis on an a priori difference between migrants and non-migrants. It is not completely saying that these differences are eliminated, but it, the starting point is not on those differences. It is noteworthy that in Germany, one of the very first black members of the German parliament, who in fact arrived in Germany as a refugee from Senegal, was elected from Halle, not from Frankfurt or from Berlin. Manchester, not New York, elected the second Muslim citizen to US state legislature in the 2000s. And the very first elected Christian woman mayor, woman mayor in Turkey was in Martin, not from Istanbul. Most importantly, none of these political figures were elected on the basis of particularistic such as black religious communitarian politics and constituencies, although there might be some hints of it varying ways, but on the basis of they were elected, but the basis of politics seeking social and historical justice and challenging the increasing disparities and politics in their respective cities. So, uh, in order to conclude, I will come, I would say that the conjecture, multiscalar analysis, 
showing the complex, entangled, and paradoxical inroads of particular kind of this neoliberal city making in disempowered cities might provide insights both about the particular dynamics fueling populist politics, but also about various possibilities for frictive, contentious commoning of heterogeneous groups for social inclusion and justice. Simultaneous to the movements, fueled by right-wing anger and resentment, migrants, minorities raised claims and became part of more inclusive politics, seeking participation as well as social and historical justice beyond the migrant native binaries and the set canons of identity politics. As I argued, the simultaneous inscription of the materiality of loss and redevelopment in urban space play an important role in the effective social fabric of the city. It is in this simultaneity, both the renovated and the abundant and their mismatches acquire a particular meaning in relationship to each other. The refurbished sites convey a message of improvement, movement and quote unquote recovery in relation to the still standing abundant sites that mark the losses. However, the most important factor shaping the effective fabrics of these cities lie, lies not simply in the materiality of abandonment, decay, and their contrast with the refurbished and the regenerated, but in their juxtaposition to the increasing social and economic empowerment of lives that came with decades of neoliberal urban austerity. Thus, economic and social domains are crucial to animate the so-called agency of the material environment in the formation of the feeling of frustration and stuckedness. The decaying infrastructures, I will come back to it before I end, the in, uh, decaying infrastructures. Uh, these infrastructures and abandoned built environment, which characterize the disempowered cities I have reported, are usually framed as tangible remnants of interrupted progress or futures that never came to be, thus evoking a yearning and nostalgia for the powerful past. However, I think the case of the, the, in the case of the disempowered cities we studied, it was the feeling of stuckedness rather than pure sheer nostalgia that they dominated the found effective ground of popular politics. I think looking through the lens of disempowered cities might be an entry point to problematize the category of the quote unquote left behind places, people as the natural set seedbed, seedbed of populism by a more nuanced analysis of the paradoxical and differential workings of urban development in cities of varying power and their resulting complex effective landscapes beyond nostalgia. Furthermore, what we saw, which I, I, I will end, I, I can't go into there, that the we, uh, for work, working on these cities enabled us to see an emerging new conjuncture marked by implementation of emergency politics, authoritarian state mechanisms and policies operating beyond the boundaries of legal inspection and parliamentary control that became, became visible and apparent in these cities before they became regional and national uh, trends. So we were able to see the injuries and the effects and the uh, grounds for the polarized politics, but also the emerging of the new conjuncture uh, more strongly in these uh, disempowered uh, cities. I think I will stop here and I'm looking forward to uh, Sheila Ben Habib's comments and your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aisha. Uh, uh, it's it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to comment on this uh, extremely uh, rich, uh, intricate, uh, detailed uh, perspective that you have provided us that uh, brings together 
uh, I was urban uh, anthropology, uh, sociology, migration uh, politics into neoliberalization and cities into an extremely complex account. And I'm sure um, myself and many of us look forward to reading uh, this, uh, this, complex, this complex text. Uh, you make a number of theoretical moves in this uh, text with which I'm in great sympathy and agreement on the one hand, but since I work more normatively and also from within the legal framework of current migration regimes, I want to um, dwell a little bit on the consequences of the theoretical shifts that you are proposing. You rightly criticize that it, the nation state framework is seen as a homogenous space, uh, not only in uh, many social sciences, maybe increasingly less in the humanities, but of course, uh, this is also the case for all the legal agreements that govern human mobility in the uh, post-war period, and particularly within the context of the 142 nations or so that are the subscribers, that are the um, signatories of the International Convention on Refugees, the 1951 Convention on Refugees. Uh, so uh, with great sympathy for you, I still want to ask uh, what exactly, what we must do also at the normative and policy level to reconceptualize the nation state uh, framework. Uh, according to the 1951 Refugee Convention, and here let me open a bracket, we know that um, uh, uh, Turkey is a member to this convention with one caveat, which I'm going to go into. According to the 1951 um, uh, convention, uh, only those people are defined as refugees who cross state boundaries. Not only people who are displaced internally, but who cross internationally recognized boundaries in accordance with five criteria who claim to escape persecution according to five um, criteria, persecution on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, political uh, belief, and social group belonging, which has become this category that international lawyers have opened in recent years to include in particular gender and sexual violence. Now, um, in the 51 uh, the, uh, a protocol, the 1967 protocol to the 51 convention, uh, there was a temporal and spatial limitation to apply this definition only to refugees migrating uh, from uh, Europe after 51. Now, Turkey accepts the um, spatial limitation of this definition of the convention refugee, but uh, rejects you know, or rejects its uh, temporality. So uh, this creates a uh, this creates a very interesting this creates a very interesting problem. Uh, the problem is that the existing most comprehensive legal document defining the distinction between migrants and refugees, etc is a deeply Eurocentric document, not only in terms of its historical origin, but also in terms of its way of trying to conceptualize and understand the distinction between migrants and refugees, thus giving rise to all the absurdities that I think you're pushing up against in discourse between migrants economic refugees and real refugees, right? I mean, these are the, uh, the law constructs a, a legal universe, a universe not only of vocabulary, but also of, of institutions. And I'm in complete agreement with you that this is a very confining and um, 
framework that I think is increasingly very problematic for understanding really truly what is going on, what is going on in, in our world. And um, this has implication also for the disjunction between mobility and displacement. And I um, would only like to point out that displacement also has a technical meaning within the context of the convention mm -hmm. that is uh, internal displaced, internally displaced persons, which are larger in number than the refugees are not counted as refugees. For example, the Rohingya in Myanmar, when they are internally displaced, are internally displaced IDPs. When they cross over to Bangladesh, they become refugees. Now, as, as you pointed out, this has consequences in terms of material benefits, in terms of legal status, um, and in terms of also how, in, in effect, these individuals conduct conduct their lives. Um, so um, I'm not defending these categories. I am just stating them and raising, raising a question. And then I really want to talk about what is so novel um, in your perspective. But as you know, um, uh, there are uh, many attempts right now to try to uh, broaden the categories of this convention in terms of responsibility uh, sharing and make it somewhat more uh, truly uh, non just Eurocentric in its, in its scope. But there is this fear that given the condition of the world as it is now, that it is unlikely that any kind of international agreement with 142, 41 signatories could be generated. So the attitude of international lawyers is we know it doesn't quite work, but please don't don't break it, don't, uh, don't uh, touch it, but we'll see where that goes. What I find uh, really interesting in your account is the emphasis on uh, migrant, and let's leave the distinction between political and economic refugees aside. Excuse me? Ex Oh, okay, somebody didn't have their microphone off. So what I find really um, uh, welcome uh, in your intervention is the question of uh, agency, political agency, and the entangled relationship uh, of migratory movements with these uh, transformations, with these broad transformations in uh, a uh, the landscape of every uh, country that is experiencing deindustrialization, or you know what you also call neoliberal uh, city uh, city making, I want to ask a little bit more about the political the political story, and I think that there are probably some stages to to this, uh, but uh, let me try to ask you to untangle a little bit. Excuse me. You tell uh, the political story on the one hand of the emergence of populist movements, not exclusively you say that one of the sources of populist ressentiment is also the experience of these cities, middle-sized city, disempowered cities, um, uh, cities of uh, displacement. And it seems as if like in your analysis, and I want to capture this um, a, a little bit more precisely, I don't know um, if populism is a consequence of first stage deindustrialization, or if it is a consequence of the second stage failed attempts at urban revitalization that you consider to have gone wrong in some respects. I think it is the second, definitely. I think you're telling the second story. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to understand this a little bit more because on the one hand, um, what you are saying is that uh, these uh, cities that sort of 
write large this, you know, what used to be, you know, particularly in Germany called the Willkommen Kultur and so on, welcome culture, right? I don't know if Manchester, New Hampshire ever, you know, even use that language. On the one hand, these cities are trying to draw to themselves um, uh, migrant slash refugee populations uh, together with public funds and international funds and a certain connectivity that migrants themselves bring. I mean, let's not let's not forget that. But on the other hand, you are telling a story about a particular kind of urbanization and capital investment that, in effect, ends up bankrupting uh, these um, cities. And um, uh, we know that one of the sort of uh, old wisdoms of migration studies is that uh, crossing the movement across the border is up to the nation state, but the burden is always borne by the city or the locality into which the migrant comes. So I'd like you to elaborate just a bit more this, uh, or this complexities of what goes wrong with this urbanization strategy because uh, again, uh, you tell a, a complex and dialectical story that on the one hand, the rise of populism, and on the other hand, a very positive story of the emergence of migrant politics beyond, beyond identity, beyond identity uh, politics. And um, I'd like to understand a little bit more the way in which you uh, connect the particular process of urban revitalization uh, to uh, to this uh, to this um, uh, political uh, to this political story. Because uh, for those of you who are here living in New York, and I know there are many people on this website who are not, um, uh, just recently uh, permanent residents in New York City were granted. Uh, municipal voting rights. And this in fact has led to a lot of antagonism from the um, uh, other minority communities, African-American community in particular, who I think see this enfranchisement of the migrants as a weakening of their own power in city, in city politics. So of course, every locality is going to manifest to manifest itself um, differently. Um, there is uh, a lot more uh, uh, to be said because you tell such an incredibly uh, rich, uh, rich uh, story, and I think that I will, I will stop there. Both of us wanted to go maybe a little bit more explicitly into the situation, into the condition of refugees uh, um, in Turkey which now itself has become the world's largest refugee receiving population with 3.5, the last time I, uh, I saw uh, the numbers. And of course, this refugee population uh, also living under you know, uh, Turkey's own uh, legislation, which interacts in complex ways with the UNHCR and international agreements. But let me stop here. And I look forward uh, to the uh, discussion and the questions as well. Thank you, Aish. Um, uh, may I respond and pick up a couple of questions? OK, thank you very much. These are very um, important and good questions. I will try to um, address them. I don't know whether I will be able to uh, respond to all of them. First of all, in terms of that the um, the 51 convention with the 67 protocol that um, we all know that that is a very um, problematic document. It is it carries its all traces of its making. And, and also the power structures of its making, that the, how the refugees and migrants were separated and uh, was also uh, 
a product of those dynamics at that time, but also exactly that, like you were saying, that it covers, actually it addresses very small group of, uh, a small portion of the people who might end up stateless or who might need protection that it does not cover. One is exactly as you had wrote about and Winter, that's why I was also focusing on in terms of displacement because it is internally, when we look at it, uh, the portion of the internally displaced uh, and who are de facto refugees in a way, in terms of the conditions of their livelihoods and then access to resources are not covered there. And Turkey, uh, of course, still not lifting the geographical limitation, which it could have done it in 2014, when that, uh, there was that the revision and they did not. They did not actually uh, picked it up. So it covers a very limited, um, it speaks to the realities of a very small portion of displaced people. And that's why I think displacement is a better term than dividing up these kind of refugees and migrants where those categories carry their uh, histories and the locations and the power structures of that uh, that time. There are certain aspects, there are certain attempts that uh, I'm sure you know uh, better than I do that the, those global camp compacts on orderly uh, migration and on those refugees. But they also, they do not have any binding. Uh, these documents have no uh, legal uh, binding uh, force, and they all carry the, in terms of the uh, responsibility uh, sharing is actually uh, getting rid of the responsibilities and very entrepreneurial documents. So they are very uh, problematic documents. Actually, I'm very proud that that we had. A, I'm one of the first. Um, uh, I, I was part of the group that made the Calcutta Declaration against the compacts. Uh, looking at those compacts from the uh, from the global south. So these refugee conventions. I mean, if you look at it, many uh, many uh, many countries have not signed the refugee convention, and then they are dealing with the refugees situations uh, and the uh, countries who had signed that they exclude so many of them and create a kind of a, um, a serial kinds of uh, problems for example in in turkey that too that you have very different kinds of categories i'm really wondering what would if any ukrainians would come they would fit into the refugee category in turkey they are coming from europe because to be a refugee you have to come from uh, from europe so i don't think that there is a way of in terms of uh the the improving the imperfections of this document. I think this document carries really the Eurocentric, it is a Eurocentric document, but also it carries the tensions between Europe and US at that time and the, uh, and the institutions, the tensions after the Second World War. So uh, it creates more problems then it solves, I think. So that in terms of the, uh, the political story, um, you're right, actually, I am saying, I, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that in terms of these, uh, these particular kinds of cities where they have attempted to actually move things and then those they failed are, a kind of a, uh, uh, not simply as being left behind, this is the ground for the fertile ground for this kinds of rise of 
this kind of popular politics. Of course, the populism is unfortunately not in the uh, monopoly of particular group of cities. That might be very different. I'm not trying to generate a kind of a theory of populism. I am looking at it from the perspective of particular kinds of sites that have been designated and singled out as the seedbed of those uh, populist uh, uh, politics. And I would like to show that there is not a one story to be so told there. If we are telling only this part, we are not telling the whole story. And, and I think uh, these places are, I found them interesting because these places will also show us where you might think that I'm wishful in my wishful thinking, but I think we have seen that how it opened very different kind of spaces for trying to envision and construe uh, um, the political community of the locality. And, and I think it is important for us to think about it beyond the kinds of those uh, set boundaries of how to include the migrants, refugees, or newcomers into the political uh, community. So I'm not. I, I don't think that. I mean, I was. I was try. I was not trying to say that they are trying. They are using this international. Um, they're attracting capital, also trying to attract these migrants. Actually, the, the migrants and the refugee friendly narratives or the minority friendly narratives are very much up to geared towards attracting capital. That it is, it is not uh, uh, the other way around, but in a way that they revalue, then they, they uh, situate the migrants and refugees in certain places in, uh, in such a way that there are different as kind of unintended consequences of it opened these kinds of uh, spaces. So I think it's very, it is very uh, misleading to see these places as being disconnected. They are very connected and they are not, uh, they are not simply shrinking places. Shrinking cities also give us a very, um, it's a very uh, problematic image, I think, because the population, they might be getting de de depopulated, but the whole composition of the city might be changing. So shrinking uh, cities designation also uh, does not tell us uh, much. Of course, the burden always comes to the city as you uh, rightly uh, under, underline, but the burden of the, the cities that I'm talking about, the burden the cities are uh, taking is a very a particular kind of the economic burden that I was talking about, that the cities facilitating, trying to facilitate to uh, uh, the businesses that the investments there, they actually ruin the basis of their, the, uh, the they ruin uh, the livelihoods of their uh, uh, residents. In terms of the municipality and then the, and why I talk about the local politics, I think this is where in, rather than thinking about, I'm not saying that laws and uh, regulations are not important, but we know that, that uh, despite the federal laws that uh, we see very different kind of possibilities of livelihood in very different places, it be thanks to the local politics. And in terms of municipal voting rights, that, uh, uh, for example, I live, uh, I live in a city in Vienna, in a city where uh, someone who came from EU uh, a month ago before the elections could vote, and 
someone who doesn't, a third country national who had been born, raised uh, in that city and not lived anywhere else has no way to participate. So that is why I think pushing the boundaries of the political community for the uh, local politics, no matter whether it is only in terms of rights or not, are very important. I think I will, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether I have done justice to your uh, questions, but um, right now I will, I think I will stop this way. I'm not sure whether there are any other questions. We have 15 more minutes, so we can okay. take questions from our audience at the moment. Um, so if any of our participants has a question to address, you can raise your virtual hand or real hand um, so that we can leave the floor to you. So, Kayla, if you have anything to add, please yeah. welcome. <laughs> sure, uh, sure. Um, there is a, there is great agreement, but um, I guess again I'm coming back. I'm coming back to to this uh, question, and this is undoubtedly a, a consequence of uh, my own uh, more normative perspective. What we are seeing at the moment agreed that the fifty one convention has a lot of flaws. Um, but what we uh, could uh, consider as an alternative rather than just saying, oh, well, it's Eurocentric, uh, want to, because I do believe that we need laws. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that we need international law, particularly, you know, at this point in the world and so on. It just want, it, it just want to, to, to sidestep. Um, Possibility, of course, is increasingly regional conventions and agreements. Mm -hmm. And there are good steps in this direction. Latin American countries mm -hmm. have something called the Cartagena Declaration, mm -hmm. where they have, in fact, broadened the definition of refugee mm -hmm. to move it beyond the five convention categories to all those who are uh, escaping you know, conditions of, of uh, a civil uh, a civil conflict uh, that is very important. But look in large swaths of Asia. I mean, India is not a signatory because yes. because India was mightily pissed off that they didn't even acknowledge the condition of refugees as a result of the partition war. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, uh, China, I believe, is a signatory, but has not domesticated. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. But there are a number, you know. So uh, you you have this situation where large swaths of the world, where refugee movements are taking place, uh, are somehow, you know, into you know ad hoc ad hoc arrangements and so on. And I am very, very interested, frankly, I didn't know about this Calcutta uh, declaration. I'm very much looking forward uh, to, uh, to reading it. So that is, uh, that is the first point, that instead of uh, just getting rid of this document, maybe regionalizing it and adopting it and getting rid of the five, uh, status categories, which, by the way, you know, you and I can agree on, but you know, attend one of these uh, just conferences and so on, and they just—it's um, very hard for you know uh, international lawyers. But I want to say something also in the context of the United, in the context of the United States, because there is an incredible amount of misunderstanding about this. And uh, I spend a good deal of time at Columbia teaching about this stuff. And it's, it, it, it's a little bit beyond the conversation, but not really because it is all about these regional variations and distinctions. Um, 
the uh, uh, United States uh, itself as a bifurcated system, on the one hand, it it grants, uh, I'll try to be short about this, it grants refugee status to people overseas. Some groups and categories of individuals are brought into the United States with that status, but individuals who reach the United States via the land, and this means mainly people from Latin America and also some other people from Africa who are using the Southern route, that these individuals are the ones now who are, you know, in the last six or eight years, you know, who have been almost like, you know, to use a French expression, les damnés de la terre, mm -hmm. you know, the damned of the earth. And this is happening despite the fact that the United States is a signatory to the convention and the 51 convention is part of US law. You know, this is something that just like nobody seems to even notice in the newspapers. The United States accepted this in 1982, but because of the peculiarities of this bifurcated system, and because the US always grants itself exemption uh, in you know, international law matters, what goes on in the Southern US border is something that is in violation, in great violation of the 51. Uh, convention in so many respects because individuals are lied to, they are not given asylum interviews. I don't want to take away from the too much from the subject matter, um, Aisha, because you gave us a very, very rich, very rich account, but um, I'm just maybe sort of um, hammering away at this point about um, uh, no matter how defective uh, some of these conventions, maybe you almost need them in order to be able to critique the actions of some governments and claim rights, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I completely agree with you about the uh, hypocrisies of in the treatment of third country nationals. I've written enough about that in the European context. Um, maybe I could also add to that. This is in terms of, I think this, this Calcutta Declaration was also uh, inspired by this, the importance of regional uh, kinds of documents also talking to the realities that are uh, not captured by the 51 Convention. And Africa, I mean, Latin America, rightly so, that you're uh, pointing out, is, is a very important, very important uh, 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 aspect and uh, place, but also Africa. And as you said, India is not a signatory of it, but there were lots of actually, there are refugees. I mean, there are I mean, not the, in the categorical way. And I'm not, I don't think that we can uh, um, improve the 51 convention by uh, ed, 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 adding some regional ones to it. That is a problem, I think, how it would be recognized. But uh, in, uh, we could show the deficiencies of the 51 convention, not in terms of only with the internally displaced or not, but when you were referring to the sea, and today, I mean, in uh, the disasters, the tragedies that were happening in, mid <clears throat> in the Mediterranean, but in the agency, <coughs> is very much related with that because the sea is also legally fr fractured, not in terms of horizontally, but also in terms of its layers. And it has been changing all the time. And then if you are um, caught on a boat, uh, your, access, your rights for within the convention also, that is in Greece, your rights would be very different. It is, this is where that, the, or if you are on an island, you are, uh, your first arrival place is an island or count on a sea or land. This is, we are talking about the same country and uh, same people coming from the same conditions. They will fit into very different rights regimes in a country where 51 convention is uh, signed. So that is my, I have, 
I mean, I do hear you, I do understand, and I really believe in that, that one should not throw any kind of the international laws are not important, but I am not so sure how to go be, uh, around them, uh, whether uh, building upon them or trying to see really like you were referring to regional kinds of uh, some kinds of conventions, maybe. So I think that is uh, uh, that is an uh, important uh, one. There is a question, but I think this is for you, uh, Shaila. Uh, I think we can both take this question. Um, I want to ask if it is possible to see refugees as a danger for the future of democracy. And the second part of the question is a British citizen going to Ukraine to fight. He said he was going there to save democracy. I wonder if we can say that there is a new struggle for democracy with or against Russia and Ukraine. Uh, refugees is a danger for the future of democracy. Now, this is, uh, <laughs> this is, a, a, this is a, difficult, uh, a difficult one. And, uh, you know, I think Aisha should jump in, in this, into this um, as well. I mean, uh, um, I don't quite see the logic behind this question. It is true that in um, a lot of um, resource poor um, countries, uh, and uh, this, you know, I think partially it's happened in Africa, the inflow of large refugee populations can add to the destabilization of regimes. It can add to the uh, uh, fracturing of already existing uh, lines of ethnic, ethnic conflict. I'm um, thinking about, I don't know enough about this, but just you know, possibly about Rwanda and Congo and fighters of the same group type on both, being on both sides of the border. And we have seen instances like this, but I want, to, I want to understand a little bit more what the logic behind, behind, the, uh, behind the question, behind the question is exactly why uh, refugees should be a threat to uh, or a danger for the future of uh, democracy. I mean, this is the way in which many populist movements um, uh, argue, but I have a feeling that both Aisha and myself completely agree that there are intelligent and good ways of accommodating and maybe eventually integrating refugees into countries without De without destabilizing them. Look, the second part of the get question gets into a lot of uh, contemporary or current politics. I don't know that I want to. I want to get so partisan about this, about these issues at the at the present. But um, uh, you know, uh, there is there is something that's happening right now where there are quote unquote foreign fighters coming uh, from both sides. I mean, if at the beginning it seemed as if, you know, uh, there was a kind of romantic uh, recurrence of the Spanish Civil War, the International Brigade uh, uh, going to fight. Now we hear Russia saying 16,000 volunteers coming in from the Middle East. Um, I, what is what exactly is going on? What's happening? But I don't want to get into the morass of the Ukraine uh, uh, Russia conflict. So I should okay. I yeah. I will. I mean, I would not get into the. Uh, I will not comment on this. The in terms of struggling for the uh, joining to uh, to the war uh, from outside. But I would say that the refugees pose a danger for the future of democracy if they are left out of possibilities of participation in the places that they are living. 
So if you cannot, I mean, the, it creates, that's why I gave you the example of, the, uh, of Vienna. It is not the refugees there, they are settled people. They are excluded. If you excluded a group of uh, um, people who are part of that locality from any kinds of political uh, participation or other parties, uh, different forms of participation and deliberation, then you are definitely creating a democracy deficit for uh, those places. So I would say that uh, if the refugees continue to be excluded in, uh, in the places that they are living, they will pose a danger. It is. It will be a danger for democracy, but not the. I think not the way that you might be uh, hinting at in your formulation. I think the other way around. They their exclusion will create a problem, danger for the future of democracy, like the exclusion of migrants in the politics. I think we've come to the end, but I do want to say a few words. Forgive me, I'm totally outside the field. Uh, my father was an international lawyer and he would say, useless. Nobody, nobody pursues it anyway. Nobody obeys it anyway. <laughs> so I'm going back to your big argument about the laws and I think you're you're right in terms of their importance. But I saw in this discussion something extremely hopeful, even though it seemed so grim. And I saw the hope in the nitty gritty details that Aisha was beginning to give us in the fabrics of the societies of these towns where everything seemed to be so depressing. I, for me, I would, build all my hopes in moving from those details to the bigger questions. My two cents. I mean, I am of course a party of this because this, I mean, of course I gave just a kind of a very overview and in a more an abstract way, but actually this whole um, different part of the story that I was telling came out during the research, we did not start with that. I was not, we were not expecting any of uh, this kind. And that I think complicates the stories and that complicates also understanding the, um, the resentments and the sentiments uh, uh, produced in those uh, places. And um, so it is, they're not really one directional, I think. Look, you need both stories. I mean, the question of whether international law is law or is a question as old as the Romans use Gentium. I mean, it's just such a complicated story, but you know, it's also a language that is constitutive of our world. And it's not true that no one abides abides by it. So I don't want to end up with yeah. normative cynicism. I want to share Zeynep's hope and I want to share Aisha's hope, but <laughs> normative, <laughs> normative cynicism, no, you know? And I think uh, the, we just have to live with the paradoxes of, you know, international, international law. The world would not be a better place if we didn't have it, let's put it that way. I think we can have the different approaches that we've seen running parallel to each other. And I hope they nurture each other, but I think forgetting the people in the cities is not going to be a solution if you impose problems from, impose solutions from above. But there we go. Uh, the two sides of the story are brought together here and we're very, very grateful to you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very challenging. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Tunch, do you have Thank anything you. to say?
Nothing to add other than just expressing how grateful we are. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Uh, we hope to uh, host you at another time in person. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.